All right, and we will get started here in just a second. I like to wait till the exact time for the wonderful people that will pop in with us today. All right, this feels so much better than yesterday when we did two of these crazy things back to back. All right, welcome to the FDN Summer Open House event number 15 out of 22. Uh, if you've uh, if you've been on for all of these, I'm, I'm curious, let us know on YouTube, Facebook, Zoom, wherever. I'd be curious to see if anyone's been on for all of them. I know we've had some people on for a good chunk of them. Today, we have one of the stars, apparently, of Summer Open House, Elizabeth Gaines. And I say that because I think this is your third appearance, which is cool. And today, we're actually focusing just kind of on you. You don't have to manage all the course trainees, which is really nice. They're wonderful people, but you know that can be a heck of a job sometimes. The topic today is biohacking deep dive. And admittedly, I don't even know the direction this is going to take today, but I know Elizabeth is fully qualified to talk about this. So I'm excited to see what I pick up from this. If it is your first time tuning in, maybe you just really like the title or you haven't seen the things with Elizabeth yet. Here is a little bit about her. She is an FDN course mentor, lead instructor and course supervisor. So she kind of, you know, groups together all the trainees, She's like the principal of the trainees, basically. So if you mess up, you end up in her office. She is also a practicing FDNP and burnout recovery specialist. She helps clients understand how chronic stress and disempowerment lead to uh, lead the body out of balance and into disease. She has had a lifelong interest in health, fitness, and nutrition, and she came to FDN looking for help healing her own burnout after a decade of working with domestic minor sex trafficking victims. After experiencing rapid relief of her chronic fatigue uh, symptoms, she decided to incorporate FDN in her own functional practice. Driven by a belief that health is the ultimate form of self-empowerment, she helps people become self-healers through education, analysis, and deep one-on-one -on -one partnership. We actually uh, touched on some of the stuff that she did in her prior career on the Health Detective podcast. I think we were still called the FDN Thrive podcast back then, but just search for FDN podcast and Elizabeth Gaines. It was a really, really cool episode. First time I got to interact with Elizabeth and we had a great time. So welcome back to the Summer Open House events. Thanks so much, Evan. It's so great to, to be here with you and with all the uh, potential uh, students out there. Really glad to be here with you guys today to talk about biohacking. Yeah. And with this one today, Elizabeth, is it um is it appropriate? Because I know you'll be presenting some stuff, but is it appropriate for uh, me to kind of throw some questions at you as we're going along? If people Absolutely. Ask? Yeah. I love um, questions in in context. Um, and, you know, I'm, uh, I'm the lead mentor here at FDN, so I'm used to fielding a lot of questions in the middle of presenting. So please bring it Fair up. Enough. <laughs> cool. So um, we'll let you do your thing. And then again, whether you're on YouTube, Facebook or wherever, we do see all the comments and questions. So uh, just let us know. Awesome. OK, I'm going to share my screen, which for those of you that know me know this is like the most vulnerable I ever feel ever <laughs> is in sharing my screen. Okay, we did it. Um, okay, so let me get all my windows arranged so that I can't see it. Great, okay. So I want to talk about, uh, you know, biohacking is such a buzzword these days. So everybody's biohacking everything. Um, everybody's wearing all the devices and breathing into all of the um, things and pricking their fingers and wearing continuous glucose monitors and all of that stuff, um, collecting data, endless data, which is really exciting to have your own data about yourself because for so long, this has been the realm of doctors exclusively. And we have not had access to our own data and we've not been able to really look at it. And so now we're in an era where we can have so much data about ourselves, but beyond collecting the data, what are the actual strategies that uh, biohacking is using and are those strategies effective? So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Yep. Okay. Got it. Uh, so I want to talk first of all about who I am. So uh, Evan gave me a little bit of an introduction, but I want you guys to know who you're spending the next hour with. Why listen to me on this topic? So um, I'm Elizabeth. I am the course supervisor and the lead teacher for the FDN certification course. I am myself an FDNP and I loved 
FDN so much that I came to work for the company. Uh, FDN changed my life. FDN um, really was the best decision that I ever made personally. So I trained under Reed, as will all of you, if you decide to come uh, be a trainee. And FDN, it's just a proud tradition where we have trained over 4,000 practitioners in this particular methodology that Reed developed using clinical observation, where for 20 years, he ran labs on thousands of people, made observations about what he was seeing. What are the patterns? What is the data telling him in aggregate? Uh, and how is he going to use that in micro to tailor a response to each individual person? So as Evan mentioned, I came to FDN to solve my own health issues, which I think uh, may be some, a reason that a lot of you might be interested in coming to FDN. After a decade of working with domestic minor sex trafficking victims and being um, what I would term a codependent, um, I was really, really burned out. And what I mean by a codependent is that I was unable to form any kind of self-love internally. So I had to have uh, external validation all the time. And what that means is that I had very poor boundaries. <laughs> I had um, no way to uh, recover if the people around me were having a bad day and not giving me validation. Um, then I had to spend the whole day wondering like, oh my God, am I, am I worthy or am I not worthy? And I think that, that it was that lack of self-love in the first place that drove me into um, working with domestic minor sex trafficking victims. It was a way for me to be able to wake up in the morning, look in the mirror and understand that I was valuable if I was doing this like deep, deep service to the world. But it came at a cost, you know, without having good boundaries and, you know, needing to be needed. Uh, I came to a point after about 10 years where I was in real physical deficit, having real physical symptoms, unable to um, get up in the morning, unable to maintain good, clear focus, unable to have sustained energy. And it just sort of got worse and worse and worse to the point where I only had a few good hours every day. And even those hours weren't great. Uh, and it was what I would term chronic fatigue. So I went to all the doctors and the doctors ran all the blood work. And the doctor said, everything looks normal. This is in your head. This is just you being depressed. So take an antidepressant. That's what you really need is an antidepressant. Um, and so I mentioned this because it's really hard when you're feeling under-resourced physically and under-resourced in your community, in your social life, in your romantic life, in your family life when uh, there is a sort of boundary between you and everyone else because you're going home at nine o'clock and you're not like able to participate in the way you once were. And because what is happening to you doesn't have a neat little title, then everyone around you is over it. They stop having sympathy for that. They stop being around for you and you find yourself really isolated. And from that position, it's very hard to continue to advocate for yourself, to be like, no, this is actually physical. This is not in my head. And I think that's the position that a lot of us find ourselves in. So when I came to FDN, I ran the labs on myself. I took the course. I absorbed it like a sponge. It was really exciting for me. Uh, and the labs, suddenly in black and white, are showing me the physical deficit that wasn't showing up for the doctors that wasn't showing up when I went to other types of practitioners because I hadn't yet crossed the line into disease. And that's what they are trained to look for. Um, so I was able to uh, rapidly use our method to identify where my body was in deficit and use our proven system to bring the bank account balances in my body up to the point where then my body knows how to spend the money and I got relief of symptoms. Um, Evan, I'd love to know how you got to FDN. Oh, geez, that's loaded. Well, one, I actually, if anything, I'd like to 
throw it back at you, not in a question, but you just, you have such a great way. You did this on the podcast too, of just engaging people in this very emotional thing. And I think it's just because you're willing to get vulnerable in front of people. So um, I just appreciate that. I imagine, especially unfortunately for our women practitioners or trainees or potential trainees out there, they really relate to this because I need to find the science on this again, because I can back this up. I just, I misquote it and I need to review it again. It's actually shown that women are more often getting told that it's in their head for very real conditions um, than not. So so obviously grass always greener on the other side, men have their things, but this is sad that women are going for years sometimes not getting proper diagnoses or recognition of what's going on. I mean, it took my mom seven dang years to get a diagnosis of an autoimmune condition uh, because everyone kept saying, oh, you're a women wow. owner. It's in your yeah. head. You're too stressed. It's like, well, sure she is. And you can be stressed and also have a condition. Um, to answer your question, I'll, I'll try to keep it short because it's not my thing today, but how I got into FDN was, I mean, I had all those health issues for all those years. I got into natural medicine unintentionally by taking a high potency multivitamin and realizing it actually moved the needle on some of my health conditions. Now it didn't cure it, but it moved it just enough that I started wondering, okay, wait a second. I've been told that I can't do anything for these seven conditions other than medication. I took this multivitamin for a few months and this seems to be working. So then I went to the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, which I'm very thankful for because it got me into the space. Mm -hmm. um, I was one of those people that did not feel like it gave me kind of what it seemed like it was going to give me. My health wasn't hundred percent afterwards. Um, and it was, it was stagnant rather, uh, which is more important. It's, it's okay to not be hundred percent, but if you're stagnant, that's a problem. And it definitely did not give me any business opportunities. So true story, Elizabeth, what happened after that is I knew that I wanted to learn about natural medicine, but there wasn't many people in my area that did it. And I know that, uh, you've lived in many places, but on the East coast, like Pennsylvania, if you asked anyone on the street, like, where do you think like the quote unquote hippies live? This is literally the mindset I had. Everyone would say West Coast. So I didn't think natural medicine was just hippies, but I figured they were into this. And so I went out to California with $1,200, me and my best friend. I convinced him to quit his job and he left with me and uh, we stayed in various Airbnbs. And then I heard um, Jen Maleka talking at a coffee shop in San Diego because I ran to all these different health meetups. And uh, she basically sold me on the spot, more or less, it was nice enough to take me out to lunch. And now they can't get rid of me. So that's how I got into FDM. Wow. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing, right? We just love it so much that we don't ever want to leave. Like I, I live and breathe and bleed FDN for sure. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Evan. Um, so for those of you that don't identify as biohackers, I just want to uh, ask this question. What is a biohacker? So it's anyone that uses science and technology to enhance physical performance. So if you've ever read a journal article and then tried to apply it to your own health, if you've ever like worn an aura ring or a Fitbit or you know whatever it is, um, showing my age there with Fitbit, um, you are a biohacker. You are using this data to try and optimize your performance. Um, so. Here's this lovely kind of picture of a, of a canyon here. And what this illustrates is that there is a gap between the way we are performing and the way we want to perform. And that is true if you uh, have clients that are coming to you with health complaints um, who are like, look, I'm just, you know, the way that I used to be in the middle of chronic fatigue and saying, God, I want to be on the other side of this canyon where everybody has energy and they're living their life and they're able to be out past nine o'clock and they're, you know, able to hang out with their friends and socialize and date and all those sort of things. How do I get there? And with biohackers, for those of you that have pretty good health, you want to get over to the other side of the canyon where there's super optimized performance, where everybody is uh, performing at this like extra high level. How do we get there? How do we get across this divide? This is what Reed would call the needs gap. There really isn't anything out there to address this need. And for me, I call this sort of the gray space um, where on, the, on, the one, uh, on a continuum, you've got people who are super, super healthy and you've got people who on the other side of the continuum have a diagnosis. Now, most of us, are not super, super healthy, nor do we have a diagnosis. We fall in the middle in this gray space where we don't have a diagnosis, but we sure as heck don't feel as well as we could. Uh, and that is where we're right in the middle of this canyon. We don't have 
uh, a whole lot of information in the gray space. That's why Reed calls it the needs gap. So are your particular strategies working for becoming super optimized or getting over whatever your run of the mill health complaints might be? Are your strategies actually working? Are, if you've got all of this data on yourself as a biohacker, what are you doing with it? Data is amazing. <laughs> I love data. I'm a huge data nerd. Um, all FDNs are data nerds. It's like, give me the shiny new functional test because I want to see how it works. I want to get in there and pick it apart. I want all the data about myself that I can get. Um, and I think that a lot of us are that way. And now we have this sort of unmitigated um, access to data that is new. We have a whole bunch of direct-to-consumer labs. We've got all the wearable devices. We've got things we can breathe in and prick our fingers and continuously monitor us and all the things. Um, so we now have this surfeit of data coming in towards us. And in this sort of like super size me culture that we live in, I think we tend to feel like more data is better. But is more data always better? <laughs> um, that's the question. I would like to answer. So what this generally leads to, this overwhelming amount of information, is that I'm going to go to Google and try to figure it out. I got WebMD. I got all of the data coming in from my wearables. I maybe got some, some blood information coming in. What do I do with that? Um, so I see some things that are maybe not working for me in all of this data, maybe not optimized. Uh, the way that it could be. Some markers are saying, oh, you're low here, you're high here. So I'm going to go back to Google and be like, okay, what can I do about it? And I might come up with a strategy or a practitioner that can say, oh yeah, I specialize in this. Oh, you've got an issue with your, um, with your estrogen dominance? Oh, I can fix that. Oh, you've got an issue with your gut health? Oh, I can fix that. Um, but uh, when we just go after these isolated pieces of data with one particular intervention or strategy, does it actually work for us? Maybe it does. We get a little bit better or we get better for a short amount of time, but eventually we're right back in the needs gap. We're right back in the valley of that canyon where it's like, mm, I want to feel better. I want to feel um better than this intervention made me feel, or I want to feel better more consistently, or this intervention worked for a minute, but then it stopped working. And we're right back to not knowing why, because we just had the one piece of data and the one strategy that went with that piece of data. So I tend to think of this a little bit like islands. Islands don't have bridges between them. They don't have um, you know, they're not connected in any way. They're separate from one another. Maybe you can like take a ferry boat over there, but it's a big deal, right? And swimming across is a big deal. Like it's, it's hard. So when we have these islands of information that tends to lead to haphazard interventions, this is what we call in FDN treating the paper is when you're just looking at a lab and you're like, mm, or you're looking at information from, from your dashboard, from your wearable or from the finger pricking or from the continuous glucose monitoring or like all the things that we're doing, right? All this data comes in, but it's in islands. The data isn't talking to itself. There's nowhere where you can go for corroboration to say like, okay, this thing looks weird on my dashboard. Why? What is the context for this? What are the possible ways that I can understand? And part of this issue is that labs and data, they tell us the what, but what they cannot tell us is the why. The why comes from intelligent analysis of the data through context and through frameworks to understand how the data relates to itself and talks to itself. Thereby, you get out off the island or the island now has bridges between it so that you can get to the next island and the next island very easily to understand how all the data is relating to itself. Um, Evan, is there anything you want to add at this point? 
no, I just wanted to say from before, you just had a, a bunch of people saying, I'm sorry, it's not questions. So that's why I didn't stop you. But yeah, yeah. Sharon at one point said 100%. Mr. Brian said totally relate. Um, and the one person was just already really enjoying what you're saying. They said that they refuse to be on antidepressants personally. Uh, their problem is fatigue and they're trying to figure out the root cause. They can't wait to become a student one day of FDM. So that's Amen. just what we have so far. Amen. Yes. Amen. If you know that antidepressants aren't right for you, uh, you know, what Evan said in, in my bio is that um, I believe that health is the ultimate form of self-empowerment and self-love. Like you above everyone, your body is yours. And if somebody's coming in and saying you need antidepressants, you know, there are a lot of people out there that do, and that's the right choice for them. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if, if you're looking inward and you're getting a strong no on that from yourself and your own innate wisdom, yes, believe that you are the ultimate arbiter of your own health. And it is an act of self-love to operate in that context. Awesome. Okay. So when we've got these islands of information, then we get into what we call the cycle of trial and error, where you go to the doctor visit um, and, or you go to the modality, you go to the acupressure person or the acupuncture person or the person that works with the hormones or the person that's gonna fix the gut. And they're gonna give you the diet, exercise, supplement or therapy that's gonna work for this one piece of data that's on, on the lab report that's out of range. And then the supplements, exercise, diet and therapy don't work. And then you're left to go on to the next thing. They're like, okay, I got to keep looking for the right diet, exercise, supplement, therapy that's going to work for me. This is what we call the cycle of trial and error. And this is what most of us are doing when we don't have a framework for understanding the data. Is we're looking at the page, we're saying, I want to shift this number up or down. And then we, we go research a bunch of supplementation or gadgets or whatever. And it's like throwing spaghetti at the wall to see, is it going to stick? Is this actually going to help or not? And maybe we get lucky and a couple pieces of spaghetti stick, but 95% of that spaghetti falls to the ground. And so maybe the two pieces of spaghetti that stick to the wall are enough. If so, you're lucky, but do we really want to rely on luck for our health and our well-being moving forward? Is that really the strategy we want? So at FDN, we believe that the real problem here is what we call metabolic chaos. Um, and so what we, what, how we tend to think of this is that your lab values and your symptoms, they're at the top of this iceberg. Um, they are a, a problem, but they're not the problem. They're the result of the problem. And the problem is the rest of what's going on underneath the water. It's all of these other deficiencies and deficits and things like that. So the way I like to talk about metabolic chaos is that by the time we have a symptom, a million things have already gone wrong. A million things have already gone wrong. There are deficits, there are dysfunctions that are happening way, way upstream. They're interacting with each other. They're smashing into each other and creating other deficits and dysfunctions. And way, way, way downstream of that, now you have a symptom because your body has done the best it can to mask it for as long as possible. So by the time we have that symptom, the symptom is not the problem. The symptom is your body raising uh, a red flag, like a referee saying flag on the play here, I need attention. You need to pay attention here. But what has caused that symptom? It's going to be different for everybody. And that's the issue with going by symptoms. That's the issue with going by the one value on the lab. It, it doesn't tell us about your unique fingerprint of deficits and dysfunctions that have been crashing around together in your specific body to create a symptom. Like if I come up with the symptom fatigue, who can relate to the symptom fatigue, right? Almost all of us can relate to the symptom of fatigue, 
But what was causing my fatigue is going to be different than what was causing Evan's fatigue. It's going to be different than what was causing Tara's fatigue. It's going to be different than what was causing Brianne's fatigue. And that's the problem with using this sounds like method. Oh, it sounds like thyroid. You're tired. You're losing your hair. Your skin is dry. Cool. Um, sounds like gut dysfunction. You got acne. You're tired. You know, whatever. So we'll just run the gut test. Um, this is why we can't do that is because these upstream deficits, dysfunctions uh, are crashing into each other, creating new ones, which become as a, a really vague symptom downstream. And we have no way of knowing what is causing what. Again, with the labs, the labs tell us what is so. They do not tell us why it is so. Same with any piece of data. They tell us what is so, but they don't tell us why. This is why in a criminal trial, you know, it's uh, uh, an attorney will come, the, pros the prosecuting attorney will come and present the facts of the crime. But what, and that's the what is so, right? That's the lab report. But it's up to the prosecutor to make a compelling case as to why the defendant did it. What was the motive? Without the why, the what falls apart. It's not that important. So what we want to do with our methodology is figure out the why as best we can. So FDN has a brilliant framework for this, uh, which we call hidden. So uh, we look at these healing opportunities within the hidden framework, which is hormones, immune, digestion, detoxification, energy production, and nervous system. Okay, so we're looking at all of the deficits sort of separately from the symptoms, separately from the lab values. Um, we're going to look at what we can see about each of these systems, hormone, immune, digestion, detoxification, energy production, and nervous system. This is our framework. This is how everything talks to itself. And I'm gonna show you in detail in a moment how all of that talks to itself. Now, is this every single healing opportunity that you can think of for the body, Evan? No, I've always looked at it as when you cover this, you're covering so much. This is kind of the point that you had about, okay, should we do? Should we have too much data or what's the downside of that? Okay, there's thousands of tests out there. Let's say someone has all the money in the world and can run thousands of tests. I mean, we could do that, but what, what does that actually change in terms of the actions? You know, it, well, one, it would be overwhelming. Uh, but two, if you do the foundational stuff, I think how Reed came up with this particular set of things is one, he experimented with labs, so that's valuable. But two, I think we're looking at some of the main systems that get affected when someone's under chronic stress. And we know this, because if you've ever had a fight or flight thing, um, when you're like scared of something, you know that your digestion starts going. And that's not just anecdotal. I mean, that's actually true. Digestion is one of the first things that shuts down. So that's probably a good thing to check if the person's chronically stressed. You're really not going to feel too bad unless something's been affected in your hormones. So yeah, that's probably a thing too. That's going to uh, you know intertwine with the immune system. So I feel like all of it uh, flows together and this covers the majority of it. And that's why Elizabeth, on some of these uh, this month, we've been fully transparent. You know, some people do the FDN foundational stuff and they get about 80% better. And then maybe we need to, you know, play around with the last 20%, uh, which we have access to, right? Because we have other labs, we have practitioners that have various um, therapies that they're well versed in, I should say, or experienced with. But then there's a good portion that all they ever needed was FDN, right? Now, at the very least, I have never once in six years of doing this, honest to God, ever seen someone not get at least 50% better from doing FDN. And it's probably actually a little higher than that. So I've always looked at it as we're covering some of the main things that go wonky when we've been under chronic stress. Yep, that's exactly right, Evan. So when we're looking at these six uh, systems, and um, Reed does throw in a bonus O for oxidative stress, um, but when we're looking at these six systems, yeah, it doesn't include everything. I'm not looking at um, neurotransmitters. I'm not looking at uh, my cardiovascular system. I'm not looking at um, my blood or brain, like none of that. But what Evan is saying is absolutely correct, that if we can get the bank account balances up in these six foundational systems, if we can get that 
better resourced, then the body is going to know with its innate intelligence how and where to spend the money on the big problems upstream that may or may not be able to be measured ever. Some of these root causes are not measurable. And so the really interesting paradigm shift here that it's very important for us to identify with the FDN framework is that we don't have to identify the root cause to be able to have an effect on it. And I'm going to say this again because it's very, very hard to get your mind around. We do not need to identify the root cause. And in many cases, it's not just one and it's not identifiable because it's so far upstream that it's not measurable. We don't need to identify the root causes to have a positive effect on them if we are dealing with the framework of H-I-D-D-E-N. If we're putting money in the bank there, then the body is going to spend the money in other places once it has it. And we're going to trust that the body knows how to spend the money. And um, if any of you have ever been paycheck to paycheck, and I have been paycheck to paycheck in my life, you know where that money is going when it comes in. You're like, okay, this month we're paying part of the electric bill. We're paying rent. We're going to buy some groceries. We're going to ignore the gas bill. We're going to ignore the water bill until we get some, some more money. Your body's doing the same thing when it's in deficit. It's saying, okay, this, this month with the money we have, these are the expenses that we're going to cover. And then it's got a whole list of like, next time the money comes in, it's going to go here, 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 and here. So when we start actually putting money in the bank account, then suddenly the body's like, oh yes, I can spend it on these really big rocks of issues that I've been having forever that have been building up because we've been in chronic deficit for so long. And that's why the H-I-D-D-E-N works. Now, with the H-I-D-D-E-N, we also teach a framework for how to understand how all of the data points in there are talking to each other. So it's not just looking at hormones and being like, this is low, this is high. So this is, these are the protocols to change the number on the paper. Um, we, we're not just looking at immune system and saying, oh my God, it's suppressed or it's redlining. So like, let's get, let's get a, a supplement in there to like fix it um, because that's treating the paper. But instead we are taught how to understand how the hormones are talking to the immune system, talking to the digestive system, talking to the detoxification system. So that when you get the values on the labs, you can say, huh, that's interesting. I need more context. And then you can go to the other labs and get that context. And you see how everything is talking to itself. So that helps you get past the what and into the why. And the why is where you can make some tailored strategies that actually help yourself and your client. That's where we actually see success is when we can connect the what with the why successfully. Okay. So I do want to emphasize FDN is a construct. And what I mean by that is that the world and all of its systems and the human body included are extremely complex, complex and chaotic. So what we need to cut through the noise of that is a system that allows us to streamline and unify what is inherently extremely complicated and discordant. So bearing that in mind, let's look at how our construct with H-I-D-D-E-N works to tie all the data together and give us a window into the why. So this is our physiological aspects of metabolic chaos um, chart, which I know looks crazy right now, but I'm going to talk you guys through it. Now, there is a version of this chart that in the middle just says metabolic chaos, and I think that's valuable too. I did not pick that version of the chart for this presentation. I picked the one where we're talking about cortisol, chronic stress as being the weak link in the middle that is affecting hormones, immune digestion, detoxification, energy production, nervous system, and our bonus O here for oxidative stress. And I did that because... This is the one thing that we all have in common as human beings that is going on in our life 
that we are not designed to handle. And that is chronic stress. We're meant to experience stress in short, acute bursts, and then relax and repair from the damage that stress did to us. And when, uh, but when we move into this phase of modern life, um, which is now happening to people younger and younger and younger, they're moving into this chronic stress phase, younger and younger and younger, then we're in this chronic stress uh, cascade where we never um, are able to come back down into our parasympathetic for very long and rest and repair from the damage done to us by stress. So because I'm starting the story with stress, that's why I chose this version of the chart that has cortisol in the middle. Now, cortisol is, oops, sorry about that guys. Cortisol is our primary stress hormone. And we have this naturally in our bodies when we are awake, because our body is expecting to have the tangle with the outside world when we're awake. At night, it's going to have us shut down. It's going to put us into parasympathetic as best it can. That cortisol is going to go away so we can sleep. But during the day, we've got to have that cortisol to tangle with the external world, which our entire human history is telling our bodies is the big question mark for survival is what's happening outside. So uh, cortisol, when it is in play, it's going to run the show. It's going to say, I need all the energy because the biggest question marks for survival are outside. That's what I deal with. And everybody else in the body is going to say, okay, let me back up and let you have it. Any kind of spare energy that I can give, I'm going to give to cortisol because we're going to get through this acute stressor and then the cortisol is going to relax and I'll get my energy back. But the twist, the plot twist here is chronic stress. So once we're in chronic stress, cortisol is always running the show and cortisol is always demanding energy from the other systems. So what we start to see first with this is that cortisol is catabolic. It breaks us down for quick energy. Uh, it does that because to tangle with the outside world, we don't always have time to sit down, eat a meal, digest it, and produce energy before we can get up and, and uh, interact with our surroundings. So cortisol is like energy on credit, where uh, the body is going to liquidate your, your uh, cartilage, your muscle, um, anything it can get its hands on really quickly to give you that energy, and then later... Uh, build it back up uh, when you are not in the stress response. So when you're in the chronic stress response, we start to get more cortisol than the other hormones that build us up. And so that puts us into debt. Now we're running this huge credit card bill for all of this energy that we've been uh, taking from other parts of the body rather than making for ourselves through the process of eating and digesting. Um, then uh, your sex hormones are going to start to get low because the body is going to say, I don't need to reproduce right now when I'm in survival mode. That gets kicked down to the back of the bus. That's why sex hormones are a great place to look when we're looking for dysfunction before it becomes a diagnosis, before it becomes a disease. Sex hormones are like the early indicator that the stress response is taking too much energy. Then uh, cortisol is going to go to the immune system and say, hey, I really need more energy. And the immune system is going to be like, hey, but I, you know, my job is to make sure that we're looking for invaders all the time, that we're stopping cancer in its tracks before it becomes a big thing. Um, my job is really important too. But uh, then cortisol is going to say, yeah, but it's life or death out there. And the immune system is like, okay, here's some energy. So now the immune system is chronically running low at like 80%. And as this goes on, it becomes, you know, 70%, 60%, 50%, 30%. That's where we're at. So we get uh, leaky gut, we get uh, a lot of um, toxins and invaders then into our gut immune system that shouldn't be there that are taking more and more money, we're developing food sensitivities, we're developing potentially autoimmune in the long run, when the immune system's out of whack for too long. Then we move to digestion. Digestion says, hey, you really only need me at full strength uh, when, when we're eating and when we have food moving through the system. So take my energy. 
I can work at 30%. That's fine. Then when the, when the stress is over, we can go back to digesting at hundred percent. So now you start to see digestion compromise. Now you've got gas, bloating, motility issues, dysbiosis, all kinds of things happening. Now we move to detoxification. Detoxification takes a whole lot of energy. So when we're in this, uh, energy demand and cortisol is like, look, we're trying to tangle with the big threats out there. Detoxification says, okay, you know what? I can find a place to stuff all the toxins. I'll put it in the fat. I'll put it in the bones. I'll put it in the hair. I'll do anything I can to make sure that you have the energy. I'll slow the liver down and tell it like, Hey, back up, buddy. Like, don't be so efficient at, um, detoxifying because we've got to throw more energy to our, our external world right now. Um, then we move on to energy production, which if we are not digesting, not detoxifying well, then energy production is totally compromised because we're not assimilating the nutrients that we're breaking down and we're not breaking down the nutrients very well. And if we've got this huge detox overload where uh, the, the toxins are all backed up, then energy production is going to be further compromised. Now with our autonomic nervous system, if we're too much in sympathetic and we can't ever come back down, then we're uh, getting further imbalances everywhere to maintain that state of fight flight. And then we get uh, oxidative stress, which is cell damage at the end of that. And once we get that cell damage, now we're compromised across all body functions. And that just gets worse and worse and worse. So this is how the construct of FDN works to allow all of the data that we're getting from our various labs, because we do measure all of these things. And the markers are here that we measure them with the cortisol DHEA ratio. We look at secretory IgA. We look at indican. We look at urinary bile acids. We look at oxidative type. We look at autonomic type. And then we have this 80HDG for our oxidative stress marker. This is how we can start connecting the what with the why is because all of this data gives us further context and allows us to really make those connections so that when we create um, a system, like when we can contextualize that data, it's going to be the key to a successful DRESS protocol for yourself or for your client. Like, otherwise I'm just guessing. I have no idea if I don't know how the data talks to itself to be like, okay, I got a couple of ideas for diet rest, um, you know, and supplements, you know, kind of based on some things that were high or low. But when we've got this better context, which explains the why for us, then we can write a dress protocol, diet, rest, exercise, stress reduction, and supplementation that has a way better chance of working for the individual because we had a better contextual view of how the data was relating to itself. Uh, and so I just want to reiterate, yes, Ev uh, yes, Evan. I just, this isn't a question. It's just nice stuff. Cause I was just thinking, I'm like, damn, she's so good with the analogies. There's so much passion in this. And as I was thinking that someone commented, we have uh, so descriptive and the information is so well delivered. Elizabeth really explains how everything is interrelated with a smiley face. And then someone said after that, she truly is amazing. So I just thought I would pause for that. Oh, thanks guys. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, so just to put this in a, in, in a different, um, uh, framework, we, we feel that there are two types of science out there. There's the science of the intervention and that's what biohacking is mostly about. Let's like put on the blue blockers and then get on the red light and take the cold plunge and, you know, get in the sauna, whatever else, because we're trying to move this one number on our dashboard. But here at FDN, we really believe in the science of the individual where we want that framework, where we can look and see, okay, I see what is what, but why is the what? Why is the what? How much further context can I get from that for this particular specific person, either myself or my client, with the way they live their life, with, the, with their personal history, with everything that's going on with them and how they're showing up? 
how do I make sense of all of that in a holistic way so that when I approach them with the dress protocol, it has a much better chance of actually working. Uh, so that is uh, the presentation. So I'd love to take some questions now if anybody has questions. It literally couldn't have been more perfect timing. Someone just, I don't know if they were just waiting for that and clicked enter, um, but you had another one come in that said, amen to that. I love listening to Elizabeth. I'm pretty sure this person is a, a trainee. So that's pretty cool. But the first question that came in. And so, yeah, guys, we got technically 15 minutes. So if you have anything, please throw it. Uh, Marilyn said, how do you test for oxidative stress? Yeah. So we have this marker called 8-OH-DG. Um, there are many ways for oxidative stress to damage a cell. So this, the marker that we are currently using, this 8-OH-DG, shows us damage to nucleic acid upon which DNA is built. So nucleic acid is part of this uh, deoxyribonucleic acid thing that is, is DNA. So when the nucleic acid is damaged, the DNA is damaged, which means that you get faulty reproduction of cells and all that sort of thing. Now, there are many other ways in which a cell can be damaged due to oxidative stress. That's the marker that we look at, and we look at that using dried urine. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I, I kind of do some of that, but it is always nice. Um, freshly minted FDNP here. Oh, it's not even a question. Just more ego stroking. I love it. Freshly minted FDNP here. Thanks, Elizabeth, for being such a big part of it. I just passed the course yesterday. That's Chris K. If you happen to know. Who that nice. Is. Go you. I'm so excited for you. Um, Christy, I'm really, yeah, I know it, it, it was, and some life got in the way for her and she persevered and she nice. did it. So I'm really happy for you. Good job. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, if there's no direct questions right now in the presentation, as we still have a ton of people on, um, I'd like to even just ask this myself is I'm still continuously learning because, you know, I do podcast stuff and I do course enrollment, but there's so many sections to FDN. So when people are trainees now, they have to voluntarily interact with you, right? By doing the things on Facebook. Uh, do you teach things in the course now or how does that go? Yeah, so we have um, several live support calls uh, throughout our month. Um, we have two that occur weekly, one with Reed and myself on Fridays called Trainee Study Hour. And that is a broad ranging Q&A where from the first day of the course to I just passed the course yesterday um, and I want my congratulations, uh, you can come on and ask anything you want. And Reed is always there. Um, and uh, I am there for, for kind of backup. Um, so we have that every Friday. Then on Wednesdays, there is a call with me called Hot Topics, where we dive into specific course concepts and we go in order of the course. So uh, we have an hour of focused discussion where everybody's asking questions and participating. I tend to teach in Socratic method uh, where I, you know, if you ask me a question, I'll ask you six more questions until we arrive at the answer together. Um, and so uh, it, it's, um, uh, we do that in order of the course, and then we have them all archived so that you can listen to the ones that support where you are in the course if you're not with us live. Then monthly, we have some calls uh, around metabolic typing and around business and around what's happening in uh, the graduate side on AFDMP. So yeah, there's a lot of ways to interact. I, yeah. uh, also, you're going to uh, interact one-on-one -on -one with your mentor during your mentor sessions, of which there are nine in the course currently. So those are one-on-one -on -one sessions, either for your personal health or as an exam, where you have learning opportunities one-on-one. -on -one, and I am also a mentor. Cool. I just, I wanted people to realize this because it, you, I mean, we just had, we're so blessed to have so many great teachers here. And I, I really think you're kind of the top in terms of teaching. And that's why it's great to have you on this course side. But, you know, I want to also shout out people like Whitney, Ryan, when he was here, like you guys, the one common theme, although you all have different styles, is you can take these super complicated things. And then not only can you break it down simply, but you can do it through analogy, right? So I'm, a, I'm still remembering the stuff that you talked about with the credit card and with the bank balances or whatever, like that's <laughs> going to stick in my head. It's a visual. I mean, even better yet, most of us have had, not all, but most of us have had a period in our life, like, early twenties, I was kind of laughing when you said it, not that it's funny, but you said pay part of the electric bill. I was like, yeah, I heard that. So <laughs> like, you guys will get this amount, you know, just to keep it on that. That's kind of hilarious just to keep it all sort of running, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And our body is doing the same thing. Yeah. 
All right, so we have some questions coming in now. Now they're flowing. Uh, Tara asked, does low homocysteine indicate oxidative stress and that the person is in complete metabolic chaos? Does oxidative stress uh, uh, is the final symptom when things have been in chaos for some time? Okay, so do you... Um, yeah. So oxidative stress, uh, let me just take these questions in reverse order. Oxidative stress is not always the final thing. Um, oxidative stress is created through free radical damage. And basically what that means is like a free radical is running around, um, with it's a cell that is unstable because it has lost one of the electrons in the electron pair. And we get this through normal cell functioning. We get free radicals running around our body or oxidation running around our body as a normal byproduct of met metabolic function. Um, but we have this system in place to uh, n negate or wipe out the effects of free radicals. And that is antioxidants. Antioxidants that we either eat or make endogenously. And I tend to think of antioxidants as like um, a cater waiter running around with an hors d'oeuvre tray of electrons and just like, hey, free radicals, take an electron um, off of my hors d'oeuvre tray so that you don't take it from a healthy cell. Because once you take uh, the electron pair, uh, one of the electrons from the healthy cell, that now that cell is unstable and it, and it is uh, promoting damage. So oxidative stress is not necessarily the last thing to happen in the chain, Tara. I described it that way as part of our construct. Um, it can just be that there's a lack of antioxidant or that there's way too much oxidation coming in from your external environment because you've got chemicals in your house or you're you know, putting chemicals on your body, you're eating processed food, you're drinking tap water with all the chemicals in it. And the antioxidants that the body is making in an attempt to control what is being made endogenously can't handle everything that's coming in exogenously. So uh, that 80HDG marker that we measure is giving us an idea of like, where are we in the pro-oxidative antioxidative balance? Are we in balance? Are we in a pro-oxidative environment? And we can be in a pro-oxidative environment just because of lack of antioxidant, Tara, not as the final piece of um, this puzzle of metabolic chaos. But yes, it's always a yes and with metabolic chaos. That can happen too, that the cells can be damaged through oxidative stress because all of this other metabolic chaos is going on. Um, and then with this question about low homocysteine, it's hard for me to say as an FDN without knowing the person, without seeing all the other lab data, without being able to clinically correlate to their symptoms and what else is happening, um, it's uh, we as FDNs don't just kind of take one marker off a page and say, oh, low homocysteine, okay, that means um, metabolic chaos or oxidative stress or all these other things. Um, it's just more complex than that, Tara. So I'm sure low, low homocysteine is an indicator of metabolic chaos, uh, yeah. But what is the root cause of that? I don't know. So I would have to focus on H-I-D-D-E-N, the healing opportunities I can see. And I would write the D-R-E-S-S protocol to deal with the healing opportunities I see in H-I-D-D-E-N. And then I would trust that the body knows how to spend the money to get homocysteine back in line. Bam. Love it. Um, I'll help you with some of these. I got a direct message from the FDN team saying, are four sets of lab tests included to retest or is it one of each test? So that's um, that's one of each you'll get included in the cost of tuition. If you chose to retest, you'd have to buy them on your own. Um, can FDN also fix symptoms of autoimmune? I, outside of the obvious reason, I, I wouldn't word it that way. Um, I genuinely believe that FDN supports everything because we, we've seen that just with how many I mean, think about the podcast and the variety of people that come through there, or I'm sure you see even more of a variety of a variety with the people you're working with, Elizabeth being um in the training group and stuff. But I think why we're really able to help the autoimmune stuff is not only because I've experienced it, but if you just go on PubMed, PubMed and like the Western medicine sciences have recognized that leaky gut intestinal permeability, they'd word it is a component of almost every single autoimmune disease that they've studied so far. Now, I definitely know we can get leaky gut better because that's objective. We can measure that on a test and it's not a perfect objective test, but you can see pretty clearly how someone's gut doing. So 
I, the reason I believe that we do so well at this is because we not only just focus on the gut stuff, but there's so many other aspects to autoimmune. And I feel like hidden is like made for those people, um, whether or not that's how it was originally intended. I mean, we have seen so many people that have diagnoses of autoimmune conditions where they are told they will be on medication for the rest of their life that are symptom free. Now, I'm not making a medical claim. These are things that people have said on the podcast. This is actually true for them. So that's kind of amazing. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Elizabeth. Yeah, what, the only thing I would add to that. Uh, Evan, is that the way we look at autoimmune from an FDN perspective is that the body has a stress bucket. Um, and it is only the stress in the bucket that the body can handle. And everybody's bucket is a different size based on their genetics and how they live their lives and all that sort of thing. You may have a super big bucket. I may have a super small bucket to start with. Now I'm adding chronic stress and all the things. Um, autoimmune is sort of like death by a thousand cuts from our point of view, where when that stress bucket starts to overflow and everything is in the stress bucket, what you eat, all the chemicals, your emotional, mental stress, um, your, uh, other, uh, internal, um, deficits, all of that adding in the stress bucket. So, um, we are, we tend to think that when the stress bucket is overflowing and the immune system is just slammed from every side and it's overburdened. Uh, I think of this a little bit like the immune system is a bar bouncer. And uh, when the immune system is like slammed from every side, it's like the bar bouncer is being bum rushed by a mob trying to get into the bar. And at that point, the immune system bouncer is not able to make sane, considered, rational decisions about every single person trying to enter the bar. So some people who should not get into the bar are going to get in for sure. And some people who should have gotten into the bar are going to be labeled as enemies. Now that's autoimmune. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of laugh every time you bring up another analogy and then you finish. I'm like, that's brilliant. Like, that's such a good way. You're, because you're right. It's just the bar balancer would normally be able to take care of it. But when you get rushed by all those people, yeah, things get in and it starts attacking sometimes the wrong things. Yep. That's awesome. Um, all right. Some more questions from YouTube. We got only a few minutes here, so we'll buff some of these out. Uh, Hot Topics is the bomb. Um, some Someone said, so every Wednesday and Friday, does the time change or is it always the same? I, I believe they're consistent times, right? Consistent time. Yep. Okay. Um, and not to mention, they have access to the recordings. Of, Absolutely. Yeah. So all the, the Hot Topics. are all have archived. Been, yep. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yep. Uh, someone agreed with Audrey saying the analogy to make everything really click. Um, can you request a specific mentor? You are speaking my language. I'm guessing that they want you as the mentor, but you're not doing the one-on-ones right now, right? Oh, I, I do some, I do some oh, one-on-ones. Okay. Yeah, cool. I do. Um, I like to keep my hand in the mentoring to make sure nice. it's, it's, we're, we're delivering the course properly and everybody understands. Um, yes, you absolutely can, uh, choose which mentors you work with. Cool. And that was not always the case. So that's relatively, um, it's one of the many new changes that we've updated FDM with. So it's kind of fun. And then some people are the opposite. They want to mix it up and you're able to do that as well. Totally. Uh, because every mentor has a slightly different perspective and point of view and different expertise. And so that's, I highly recommend going through with different mentors, treat yeah. it like a buffet. Can quizzes and or exams be retaken? Uh, the answer is yes to all of them. Uh, disclaimer, depending on what type of quiz you're taking, because some of the quizzes, like in the beginning, like we do very simple ones just to help you get the main points out of the video that you just watched. And those can be taken a million times. We don't know about it. Like it's, it's pass or fail. Yes. You need to pass it to move on, but you could do it a hundred times and no one would know. That's um, so true. not a big issue when you move towards the end of the course and you start to get to that one-on-one -on -one mentorship side, there is some testing involved there. Uh, the oral finals, actually how you graduate from FDN. There's the written exam. Um, these are pass or fail. And I believe if you fail those, uh, they do have to wait some period. And then there is a, a retesting fee, right? Just like you would have for a proctored exam. Yep, that's correct. So uh, because it's it's mentor time to redo the session, um, we have to charge a retake fee. Uh, but yes, it's absolutely retakeable. Yeah, cool. And I, I appreciate you explaining that because I think sometimes people don't get that. It's like we don't we're not retaking money to make an extra buck. Like there, there's a person working with you one-on-one -on -one and they need to be compensated for their <laughs> Absolutely, time. So yes. that's mm -hmm. kind of how that works. Um, why do other health coach certifications say that you cannot decipher blood or lab results? What makes an FDN able to do labs? Thank you with three exclamation marks. Yes. Okay. So um, what we do uh is we work with something called a medical director program. So we actually have a licensed doctor 
uh, who is extending his license for those tests that require a license to be extended. Uh, we've also made relationships with labs out there, like our relationship with Dr. Gonshore and Fluids IQ. He's decided that we have such a stellar education that our certification is good enough to set up a practitioner account at Fluids IQ just on our own so that we can order any tests from there. So we do have relationships with several labs out there who say the education is phenomenal. So yes, your, pra your practitioners can set up a practitioner account at my lab. So Precision Analytical is like that. Um, Fluids IQ is like that. There are several other labs that are like that. Uh, and then for the ones that say, no, I really want um, you to be licensed in order to order these tests, that's when we go through our medical director program where the, uh, the licensed doctor is allowing us to use their license because he also believes in the quality of the education. Yeah. And let's just, I mean, let's also call it what it is. It's a heck of a lot of work, as you guys can tell, and if you've been trainees or whatever, to train people to be able to do this properly and ethically. And, you know, most place, I'm just calling it what it is. Most places would never be able to charge as little as we charge for what we're giving. Because it's funny when people will compare us to other courses, I'm like, no access to labs, no one-on-one -on -one mentorship, whatever. It's like, do you understand how much extra uh, goes into that? So it's kind of how that works. Um, this is just hilarious. Chris said, I can never remember 8-O-H-D-G, so I call it 8-O-H hot diggity. I'm like, that's another thing that will stick, so thank you. Um, Mr. <laughs> Brian said, speaking of homocysteine, do FDNs look at uh, the genetics too? I can actually answer this one. We don't look at the genetics um, directly in the foundational courses, and I don't want to get confusing, but FDNs have access to so much stuff after graduate. The reason we do that is if you have a particular area of interest or you're working with a certain client base that wants it, we want you to be able to go as far as you want to go with this. So the foundations crush it. You can have a very successful business and help thousands of people by just doing that. In fact, many of FDNs, that's all they've ever done. Uh, but we do have access to genetic testing upon graduating through GX Sciences. I've used it myself. Um, and what's interesting, Mr. Brian, is that by the time I ran the genetic testing, because we didn't get it until years after I graduated, I already felt great, but my genes are trash. I got methylation issues. I got all this kind of stuff. And so I really think it proves the point that genes load the gun, environment pulls the trigger. So FDN helped me with the environment and all the lifestyle stuff. The genes almost became irrelevant. Um, I had mildly elevated homocysteine. So I was glad to learn about some of the things I could do with like methylfolate and methylcobalamin. Um, but that was about it. Everything else was pretty much irrelevant for me at that time. Um, last question, if you don't mind, Elizabeth, because I know Absolutely. we're two minutes Let's over time. How about internationally? What are the legalities for working as an FDNP in Germany? Well, I don't know about Germany specifically, but we are, um, the, our legality that kind of covers us everywhere, uh, is that we are self-treating. So our clients are self-testing and they are self-treating. We're just the conduit to give education and to give access to that lab information. So um, the labs that we teach in the course are not specifically available in Germany, but we do have a package of labs that is. And so international trainees get that package of labs that cover H-I-D-D-E-N um, is all you know basically the same uh, markers, just a little bit different testing. And uh, as long as you can get information about your H-I-D-D-E-N, then you can you have the context to work with that information. So yeah, um, absolutely. We have FDNs all over the world, Germany included, and the, we have lab partnerships everywhere to get it done. It's just not always the same labs. Cool. Elizabeth, thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, real quick announcements for you guys. If somehow you do not know the schedule of events, you can go to fdntraining.com slash summer and catch it there. If you want the replays, it's fdntraining.com slash VIP. And then you can get the replays of everything that we've done so far this month and will continue to do. You'll also get access to the private Facebook group for VIPs where you can ask questions any day to our staff. The next event that will be coming up, event number 16, unfortunately, I will not be here uh, for this one specifically. It is on June 23rd, so tomorrow. <laughs> it is how to attract profitable partnerships and clients using LinkedIn with Haley Rowe. Uh, Haley is so good at the business side. She's like the real deal. It's not someone that teaches business coaching because they didn't know how to do business. Uh, it's someone who had major success in business and then went on to teach it as well. She currently has a podcast that is within our top 10 most listened to podcasts 
podcasts of all time called Anyone Can Be an Entrepreneur with Haley Rowe. So I'm looking forward to that one, but I'm going to have to catch the replay because I will not be here. And Joe will be hosting that one. Joe Pate is, she does a lot of things, but she is actually usually the person you're probably talking to outside of Kurt if you've ever messaged us on Instagram. So she runs the entire social media side um, and she does stuff with our podcast as well. So that'll be Joe Pate and Haley Rowe. And then I will be back with you guys on Monday for event number 17. It's going to be an awesome week next week. So Elizabeth, again, thank you so much for making so many appearances this month. And um, I think you finally get a break. So we appreciate you very much. Oh, it's my pleasure, guys. I really enjoyed being with you guys today. Have a wonderful rest of your week.